Well, today we're talking about rescue. And, you know, we all have different kinds of troubles in our lives. How many of you have ever locked your keys in your car? Raise your hand. <laughs> wow. How many of you locked your keys in your Keep your hands up. If you've locked your keys in a car and you kept it and it was running at the time. <laughs> Holy cow, that's way more than I thought. I thought I'd be the only one with my hand up here, but I guess not. I'm going to share a little, quick little story here about locking your keys in your car. We were at a restaurant with my uh, sister and her husband, my brother-in-law, and my wife was with me. We were coming out. We were over in Kenosha, and we come out of the restaurant, and we go to, we had a great meal coming out, go to the car, and I get to the car, and I grab the handle, and man, the door's locked. I didn't remember locking the door, and so I, you know, dig in my pocket, and I'm like, oh no, I locked the keys in the car, and we're in a big city, Kenosha, so the cops aren't going to come out and do this for you for free, so I'm going to have to call a locksmith. You know, like 150 bucks. This is going to be horrible. Well, my brother-in-law goes, oh, no, don't worry. I got AAA. I'll just tell him it's my car or something like that. And he'll just come in and we'll just jimmy that door right open. I'm like, oh, well, that works. That's fine. So the guy, AAA, comes. We had like about 20 minutes. He comes and he starts fishing on the door. And he's fishing. And he's fishing pretty hard. He's like, man, this is a tough one. I'm like, well, let's not break the window, okay? You know, and he's kind of going at it. Finally, he pops the lock. And uh, he's like, oh, there you go. So I open the door and I get in the car and I sit down and I go to where the keys should be. And they're not there. Huh. And then I look in the council, and there's two soda cans in the council, and we didn't have any sodas on the way over. Huh. So these little drips started pouring down on me, and I look around the car, and nothing is anything that we own or would have in our car. And then it just, like a flood, starts to come over me as I look about four stalls away and see our car parked in a different stall. And so very cautiously, I got out of the car and I thanked the gentleman. I said, can you follow us over this other car? I might have locked my keys in that car. And he had this look on his face. I'll tell you, like, oh my God, these are the dumbest people I have ever seen in my life. Now, thank God those people did not have a window seat in the restaurant and their meal took a really long time. Otherwise, God only knows where we would have been and I would have needed a huge rescue uh, to get out of that situation. There's a wonderful tension in the Bible between God's blessing in our lives and the statement that Jesus made where he said, in this life you will have trouble. And I know for some of us here that might be the understatement of the century. Pastor Dale has been leading some of us here in a class called LTT, which is Leadership Think Tank, and many of you have gone through it, some of you have, some of you haven't. Um, but in one of the things, one of the rituals, or whatever you want to call it, that he led us to do in there was to write out our life story. And if you've never done this, I really would encourage you to do it. It really gives you a perspective of kind of the journey you've gone with in your life. Uh, I was fascinated when we did this, and we all shared in a group, about how many different people when you looked at their lives, were just nothing but basically one set of difficulties after another. And how through all these diverse challenges, God had rescued so many of them. In my own life, there had been several defining trials that I needed to be rescued from. And so my takeaway from that exercise was that God wants to rescue us. And my hope that your takeaway from today's message is that God wants to rescue you from your problems and in your problems. Maybe some of you are looking at your life and thinking, well, I'm not sure about this rescue thing. So let's take a quick look through the Bible and kind of see what God has to say about rescues. First, let's look at Psalm uh, 18, verses 16 through 17. There it is. He said, He reached down from on high, and he took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. Drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, for my foes were too strong for me. God is in the rescue business. Look at this a little closer. He rescues us from those problems that are too strong for us to deal with. He draws us up from the deep waters. Think of, think of times in your life when you were drowning in a problem and you needed a rescue. God is there to save you from those deep waters. And is, this is just two verses in the Bible. When we look at the Bible as a whole, it is a book of rescues. From cover to cover, it is nothing but a book 
of rescues. From Adam and Eve in the very beginning in the garden, they needed a rescue. On through Noah and Moses and Samson, all the way to the New Testament for Peter and Paul, they had all needed rescues from God at some point in time, sometimes multiple rescues from God. They all had many problems on their own, and they absolutely needed God to rescue them. We need God to rescue us. It's one of those wonderful things about human design is that he designed us to need him, and he designed us to want to be rescued by him. I'm going to play a video today. We're going to play it in three different parts, and it will tell the story of rescues that God had to perform with three different individuals. Um, it's from a church that I used to attend when I lived in Hawaii, and so the scenery is a little bit different and the accent's a little bit different, but the people's needs and the God that meets them is the same. So let's take a look at the first clip here. So I had my, my daughter who was there and I was pregnant, this is my second child. And so he was driving, then he said he's gonna dump us off somewhere. Then he started to go up towards the pulley and he had always like thrown this thing out, well I'm gonna throw you over the pulley one day. I didn't know what was going to happen, so as he was driving, I was slowly unbuckling my daughter on this side, and then I just scooped her up one time, and I just got out of the car, and I just started running. And so, like, I had my three kids, but it was really not a good place to be. It was abuse, but then there was so much more than that. There was fear because I wasn't only um, abused sexually. I was um, beaten a lot. You know, there was just that fear of the person who abused me. As we got older, we kind of drifted. What I was doing, I wasn't home I wasn't home much. I was doing my own thing. Ultimately, the, I was sad every day because I felt like he didn't care, or didn't love me or hit the family anymore. I thought that, you know, I just had to get through this and then it would be okay and we would, you know, get divorced and that would be that. I honestly felt that was gonna be it for us. You know, after I realized what happened to me, it was shame. I felt shame, and I hid it because, you know, it's, it's nothing that you want to talk about. In terms of the finances, you know, um, when I left, I did not have a job. I was living on my student loans. I took out student loans to pay for my sitters. There's things like, you know, like we go to the store and then people like assume like you're on welfare. <laughs> so they're like, oh, we just push EBT. I'm like, I don't have one of those, you know. Be nice, but I don't have one of those. As I got older, you know, I didn't find myself worthy. So I would just, you know, do whatever, sleep around. And it was just, it was not a good life. And now, where I'm sitting at and looking back, I now know what it was that I was trying to feel. It was the love that I was seeking. I decided that the only way that I could do this is if I just packed a bag and just left. I guess that's when I took a step back and, and realized that I didn't want it to be over. Their lives are in a tough place. And maybe you're thinking, well, you know, those are interesting problems, but it's not like the problems I have. Or maybe you really identify with some of the problems here. So when preparing this, I kind of looked through the Bible, and I found out there was, through different searches, through the internet searches and through some other things that I read, that there are over 150 different problems 
that God rescues people from throughout the Bible, over 150. So I kind of found a list online, and I said, boy, you know, those top nine, that top nine looks really great. And I said, I bet you if I just talk about these top nine, I said this to myself, I think everyone in the room will find something they can relate to and something that they need to be rescued from. So we're going to go through the top nine problems that God rescues people from in the Bible and in our lives. The first one is stress of life. Stress of life. Over and over again, stress is one of the enemy's greatest tools to get people's eyes off of God and onto the wrong things. I personally don't know anybody that's gone through life and said, I've never had stress in my life. We all succumb to this at times of time, and we all need a rescue from it. The second one is the attacks of others. We often have to deal with others that have resentment or bitterness towards us. And often, if we try to deal with this alone, we make a bigger mess than we started from. Relying on God to heal broken relationships is essential. You know, the cord of three strands is not easily broken. And when you're trying to mend things apart from God, so many times our emotions and, and past problems just entangle us and we make bad decisions and we say the wrong things and we end up doing more harm than good. The third one is guilty conscience. You know, it's just human when things go wrong or we experience a failure that we look to place blame. For many of us often, when we, we look to, the blame comes and it falls on us on ourselves, and we have to deal with tremendous guilt. Now, I was raised Catholic, so we had a lot of guilt in our house when we grew up. <laughs> and if you were raised Catholic, you're probably laughing right now and know exactly what I talk about. And I had a Jewish friend, and still do have a Jewish friend, who says, well, you've never seen any kind of guilt until you have Jewish guilt. He said, there's quite nothing else like it. So, and he shared some of the family stories, and I had to acquiesce that, yes, Jewish guilt was the highest form of guilt there is out there. Guilt can just rob you of so many things. It can rob you of living the life that God wants you to live. And God absolutely wants to rescue you from a guilty conscience. The fourth one is fear of death. I wish I had the time to explore some of these further because each one could be a message really in of itself. Recently, having witnessed the death of a family member who from all outward appearances had no relationship with God, I saw firsthand how excruciating and how painful and how debilitating the fear of death can be in someone. It truly stole the last moments of her life because that's all she could dwell on. The fifth one is hell. This is a place that men were never supposed to go to. And we can be rescued, be and we can be rescued from there also. You know, Hell was, not, was designed for Satan and his followers and not for us. And God wants to rescue you from there. And the only reason that, that we would even have to worry about such things is because of that. Number six is the prison of addictions. You know, we talk a lot about getting rescued from addictions at this church. And to truly become free of them, only God can perform that rescue. Pastor Dale talks repeatedly about addictions. And, and we have a lot of addiction support here. We have the River Rock on Saturdays if you struggle with that. Um, it's... We are a church that is focused on helping God rescue people from addictions. The seventh is financial distress. Interestingly, the Bible talks more about money than most topics, yet it's the one area where many of us never seem to want to let God in. God's okay at church. God's okay in my words. God's even okay in my actions. But boy, when we open that pocketbook, sometimes it's so hard to let God inside there and have control of that also. Number eight is traps we don't even see. Traps we don't even see. Yeah. I love this one. You know, <laughs> I love that graphic too. That's really good. <laughs> um, pride, envy, unforgiveness. Um, these are the things at times that don't even show up on our radar, yet they are an offense to God, and he wants to rescue us from us. This is the, these are the ones that we can go in day in, live day in and day out, and we never address because we just don't see them because they're hidden from us. And number nine, brokenheartedness. God is a God of new beginnings. God is a God of second chances. And after a broken heart, it may feel like all is lost, yet in that dark place, God never leaves us. He always has a rescue plan just waiting for us. I love what it says in Psalms. It says, God is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. I'm here to tell you that in some of my darkest darkest times in my life when I was broken to the very core. That is when I have been most intimate with God, where I have seen the most 
growing relationship I've had with him. It's oftentimes in those good times where I can just kind of put God on a shelf and say, God, I'm doing great on my own right now. I don't need you in my life. I'm okay. And if I need you, I'll give you a call. But I'll tell you what, in those dark and broken-hearted places, that's where God wants to meet you. That's where you're going to grow and have a great rescue from him. So what does this all mean? There are no problems. I want to stress this. There are no problems that God doesn't care about it. Nothing is too big, nothing is too small for God to rescue from. It's about at this time that most of us can think of a place, here or there, where we had a problem and the answer we wanted, the answer we wanted, never came. So I want to make this delineation. He can rescue us from every problem. He can rescue us from every problem. But he will not keep us from every problem. He will not keep us from every problem. Let's look at Psalm 34, 19. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. The righteous person may have many troubles. Righteousness does not block problems from our lives. Some of you were told when you were kids that if we just live a certain way, if we just do good things, our lives would be somewhat problem-free. Some of us were even told that God wanted it this way. Jesus doesn't always calm the storm, but when he will, he all, and, but he will always guide us out of them. Let me tell you, it is not a life free of problems that God is calling you to, and this is a tough, tough teaching, especially in our culture. Our culture says just take a pill and all your problems go away, and that is counter to what you see in the Bible, and it's counter to the way God works. We watch television, and in every 27 minutes, because you've got to count for commercials, the problem is solved, you know? The, the family is reunited. The murder is solved. Gosh, those murder shows, man, every, every hour there's another murder solved, and it's amazing, and, and we get this feeding into our minds, and we think that's the way life should be, that hard times should only be for a very short duration, and there should be an awesome, awesome solution and then I should just move on and everything should be good. But that's not the reality of life. That's not been the reality of my life and I would argue that's not been the reality in your life. And it was not the reality of people in the Bible. Let's look now and see how God is starting to rescue the people in our videos. Go ahead and roll the second video. You don't realize how much you need, you need God and um, until like you really, really need, <laughs> you really, really need God. We've been attending New Hope for over eight years now, and I know God, but I think my relationship with God wasn't where it needed to be. It, I, I think it, like I drifted from my wife, I drifted from God. In terms of the finances, you know, um, when I left, I did not have a job. I was living on my student loans. I took out student loans to pay for my sitters. My rent was going to be due, and I only had enough for one more month of rent. That was a point where I was just really relying on God. I had already you know, started coming to New Hope, and so I knew a little bit about what it was like to have a relationship with God. I would be in service, and I watched the halal. I had this yearning of wanting to do that because I used to dance before when I was younger so I I joined in and what I felt was safe in the halal in the group I felt safe to be able to share even though I was scared I knew I would be safe I guess you find your own place that we're all comfortable in in how we relate to God you know how what you know and it got more personal for me when I would um, pray or read scripture, that was the place where I found comfort. The big ways that I think um, we've seen like our lives change, I think is definitely, well I think education of course is very important to me. So my children have been able to go to good schools and they've gotten financial aid and they've gotten to enjoy summer programs that would have cost a lot of money. I got into my master's program. I got to send my daughter to Europe for um, her school so I think that that's been kind of neat and then all the while we've been able to also give money away to other people. I started to pray again and I haven't prayed in a while. Um, even started praying with my wife and it just started to change me. 
Yeah, I think before everything was so negative and um, everything was negative. Everything was about me. And there was, um, you know, lots of, of uh, drinking involved. That, and you know, he decided on his own too. That wasn't going to work for him. All of a sudden, like you just get this peace, and then you're able to just fully like release whatever happened in the past. Is that's in the past, but you can just move forward. I was with the Halal group, and um, you know, Ro asks, you know, is there anything that is um, burdening you guys? You know, we'll pray for each other, and it was after we were dancing, um, practice after practice and my heart was pounding, it was racing, and I just felt like I just need to let it out. As I told them, it was just this big relief and big burden that just was off my shoulder. We both brought God now into our marriage for the first time and made my relationship with God a little stronger as well as our marriage stronger. It was kind of like a slow transition to um, to knowing that he's like he's really real. Like it's not just you hear about it and you sing about it and you can read about it. I felt like <sighs> I could breathe again. There, aren't their stories just amazing? I mean, I was so compelled when we saw this in Hawaii, and I, I said, so someday I'm going to teach on this, and then someday I want to use that video, and I was, they were so generous to share this with me. Um, we're starting to see how God is going to rescue them, but you may be thinking, I have a problem. Where, where is God for me? You know, I'm not getting my rescue. I've got this problem, and I don't, I don't see a way out. My daughter, Sarah who is now 11 going on 30. <laughs> and any of you know or know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, went through this very interesting phase when she was about two. We called it the I do phase. And I think most kids growing up kind of go through this. Everything from tying her shoes to getting dressed, I do, I do. You know, you're like, Sarah, let me put your shoes on. No, I do. And then it's this, and it's this. And 10 minutes later, we're still building something that's not a bow or anything like that. And I'm like, Sarah, just let me help you. No, no, I do. I do. Just let me help. I can could, I could get this done in two seconds. No, I do. I do. Let that sink in a bit. How many of us, when God asks us to help, we say, no, God, I do. I do. God, you stay out of this. This is my problem. The psalmist says it best in Psalm 18, 27. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. And haughty is just another word for prideful or high-minded. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. Humility is the source of our rescues. If we are lacking in humility, we are lacking in rescues. God will let us fail until we realize we need a rescuer. Let me say that again. He will let you fail. He will let you fail until you realize you need a rescuer. Some of us here have maybe grown up in a in a church home, or we've just been having lived a really successful life, and we're kind of in this message right now. We're kind of thinking, well, this is great for so and so. You know, he's got a drug problem. This is great for so and so because she's got this problem. Let me tell you right now, this message is great for you because you are struggling with humility because you've never needed a rescue. There was a time in my life when I was so puffed up and so full of myself, it was disgusting, and I would have never turned to God for rescue. I could handle everything. And any time God said, came to me and said, you know what, I kind of want to help you with this. You got a problem here. I got it. Don't worry about it. I got it. Be careful in that. Submit yourselves to God. Be humble before him and admit you need a rescue. Whether first And the first thing to do when you're looking for rescue, the first thing you do, and it's so simple, is you just have to call out. Like they were calling out. He just said, I hadn't been praying in a long time, Daryl, but he said, 
I just felt like I needed to pray. He called out to God. And whether you're doing that in your quiet time with God or just a daily time or however it's coming, just the simple prayer of Jesus, help me, starts the rescue. The simple phrase of Jesus, help me, will start the rescue. Psalm 91.15 sums it up. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and I will honor him. Then, and this is for the most of us the hard part, we need to cooperate with his rescue instructions. We call upon God. He was going to deliver us. He is going to honor that call. But then God's going to give you rescue instructions. And whether those instructions are to cut up the credit cards, to stop clicking on those internet sites, to start asking for forgiveness, to start giving forgiveness, whatever it is that Jesus instructs you to do, and I'm going to date myself here, just like Nike used to say, just do it. Follow those instructions. When you get them, do them. And trust me, there's a book full of instructions here. There's instructions that you're going to get from God. You can ask other people how to help you in this situation. We have a cloud of witnesses here that would love to help you if you're struggling with something and you're looking for a rescue. God wants to rescue, and he's created an opportunity for you to be rescued. So what does that look like? What exactly does that look like? How do rescue instructions get into me? Well, let's look at John verses 14, 15. 14, ah, chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So if the command equals the rescue instructions, and if you love Jesus, you're going to obey those rescue instructions. And then Psalm 91, 14 says, because he loves me. And remember, the, 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 the view of what he, if he loves you is that you are obeying those rescue instructions. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. I will rescue him. I will protect him. So when we follow the, the directions that God has given us out of the problem, we demonstrate the love that God, that we have for him, and then he rescues us, he protects us, and he restores us to honor. So these following two scriptures give us a picture of Jesus at work. We call out to the God and obey him and, he's, and, that, and what, do what he says, and that demonstrates our love for him. I will rescue you. I will protect you. We're going to look at the last segment now, and we're going to see how these rescues finished out. Go ahead, play the third video. I work at a school, and I just think that I'm blessed. And I just, he took me from where I was when I was like 19 and making very bad choices um, to where I am now. And it's a very different place than where I was. You know, I do devotions in my room, and like, it's so dark. Like, I have these blinds, and it's like just this light comes in, and, I'm, and, and as I'm reading, I'm like saying to myself, God, you're with me. You can really feel it if you really ask for it. Sometimes, like, in the midst of everything kind of going on, and you don't really know which way you're going, this way or that way, and you don't really know, but somehow like, it's a very heavy like, peace that can just come. A lot of people have told me this, and it's so true, is that there's a peace about him that, that's never seen before, as long as I've known him. That's the, the blessing, I think, is that we both found ways to um, to work within ourselves, you know, through God we work within ourselves to become better as individuals and better together as husband and wife. You know, I have this um, book that I keep all of these blessings in, so I have a book and um, some things that I have anxiety over, some things, and like I'll write it down and then, but you still keep moving in the way that you're supposed to keep moving. And sometimes when I flip back through my book, I'm like, oh, that's been answered, that's been answered, that's been answered, and you can cross these things off your list. It's pretty amazing. Within the past, say, six months to a year, I've learned things that I didn't even know about my wife. You know, it's just from sharing and communicating. It's not the same man that I've been married to for 20 years. He's such a great husband, and with our kids, 
they're so happy, you know. My one daughter said, we have our dad, you know. He's so, he's just such a, a honorable man of God. That's how I feel, and I respect him so much. As, as we drifted, me and my wife drifted apart, our family kind of drifted apart, our kids and everything. And now, it's like our, our family is whole again. God is mindful of me, and he does think about me. And his grace covers everything from the past that I've been through. Even though I go through trials, I trust that he will get me through it. I, uh, I don't know why that one, though, so one always gets to me. Um, you know, God has rescued them. And they're, when this video ends, their lives didn't end. And they went on and they struggled afterwards. And just because you've been rescued doesn't mean the struggle ends. You know, there's temptations and pitfalls that will come. And sometimes those temptation and pitfalls come so fast, the enemy is so quick on, one, on someone that's been rescued and so fast that you never even realize the rescue happened because you instantly fall into temptation and you're right back where you started. We're going to look at three temptations that dog a lot of us. Now, there's a whole lot of other ones, but these three are the root of a lot of things. And I'm going to call them the three Ps. And the first one is possessions. Possessions. I want, I want, I want, I want. We are buying things we do not need with money we do not have to impress people we do not like. I don't understand this. I don't understand this. You know, there was a time when I had a house chock full of stuff, and it eventually God led me through that, and it made me sick that the amount of money that I had spent on stuff that I never even looked at. Any of you watch these horror shows and you just watch, now this is an extreme case and I understand that, but my God, there's stuff piled up everywhere and they don't even know what they've got, stuff brand new in the box. It's unbelievable. We are a culture that is addicted to buying things. You know, the next time you're at a store, you're at Goodwill or you were at a rummage sale, wherever you're at, and you pick something and go, well, that's nice. Do you really need it? Even if it's a penny, do you really need it? Think about it. Just think about it. Second, People, getting caught in the approval and acceptance of people and getting in that cycle will derail God's rescue. So many of us are so caught up in, well, I'd love to give this up but, or I'd love to change this part of my life, but so-and-so may not like me or uh, somebody's going to accuse me of something or this is going to dredge up all this bad things that I had done with this person and I don't want to offend them anymore. Get over it. Move on. You've got to break that approval addiction. You've got to break that acceptance issues and make sure that the rescue sticks. The third one, and the one that many of us and the one that I personally suffer with a lot is pleasure. I am the guy behind the pancakes, by the way. <laughs> and uh, first I want to say, God wants us to enjoy life. God wants us to enjoy life. That's not what I'm saying here. But there is a pursuit of pleasure, a hedonism, so to speak, that is contrary to God's plan for your life. You know, when I Googled for that picture, I thought, well, I'll just type hedonism and I'll get some really fancy pictures for that. And uh, boy, you get some fancy pictures when you Google hedonism. I'm not recommending that to anybody. Um, but one that was set that just kept coming up were these 40, 50, maybe even 60-year-old individuals whom looked like they were 15 still, and they're partying and living like they're 15. And there's nothing wrong with having a good time, but you could just tell from the pictures that this was the always lifestyle of these people. This wasn't an event here and an event there. This is where they lived and they've never changed. They've been 15 forever. And I'm telling you, if you're one of those people that just can't accept the honor, the respect, the responsibility of being an adult, you're struggling with this excess of pleasure here right now. Always remember that God made you. That God loves you just as you are. And I know this is a cliche statement, but it is so accurate. God does not want you to stay there. God loves you as you are. He loves you for who you are. But he wants you to grow. He wants to rescue you. 